even though Shirley doesn't agree, I think it's one of the greatest culinary inventions of modern time because it allows you to take all these things, these ingredients, and just throw them in here. You don't really have to do much. You can just add everything in there, whatever the recipe is, and then walk away. Just walk away. And make sure you plug it in before you walk away. And if you walk away, and it's plugged in, and you come back to it, uh, whatever the time is that's required, you have this warm meal waiting for you. Now, I have to admit, even though I think it's a great invention, I am not a skilled crock pot cooker. But I have heard the praises of others who really love the convenience and the promise of the slow cooking device known as the crock pot. Now, a little history about the crock pot. Maybe you already know some of this, but I'll share it with you anyways. The crock pot was invented by a fellow by the name of Irving Maxton. Now, Irving Maxton took the idea of slow cooking uh, from watching his mother uh, prepare a Jewish bean stew called shalat. Now, shalat is, is, is this, this, this combination, very simple stew that's put together. But let me just share a little bit of history from the internet about the making of the crock pot and the shalat, the stew that gave it birth. The stew known as the shalat is a traditional Jewish dish that cooks all day. It's rooted in the Jewish Sabbath, the day of rest in which the observant Jews are not supposed to do any work. So the stew is supposed to go into the heat before sundown on Friday night, and then on the Sabbath, the next day, Saturday, it's all cooked through. And the observant Jew can come back from synagogue, and there at the end of Saturday services is this stew waiting for them in the slow cooking pot. Now, the pot that was used by, by Naxton's mother was not a crock pot, but he got the notion, he got the idea that he could make something that would work very similar to the bean pot that his mother used to use and put in the oven and cook at a slow temperature, low temperature throughout time. And so this stew is a basic stew of potatoes and onions and beans and barley, chicken and spices, and it's all placed into the pot, and it's not looking like dinner at all when it's put in there. But 20 hours later, it's a feast in waiting. All the ingredients of creation mixed up and prepared for a people in waiting. Psalm 104, which Charles read to us a portion of it this morning, begins by praising God, the majestic creator king, who has control over all the ingredients of creation. God, the creator who opens the skies like a curtain, says the psalmist. God, the creator who built a home on the waters and travels in a chariot of clouds powered by the wings of wind. God, the creator in the imagination and the proclamation of this great psalm writer. It's the same God who established earth on a secure foundation, says the psalmist, and then covered it with water higher than the mountains. And God, too, controls the direction and location of God's creation, turning back those same waters and, and filling the valleys established for them, and then setting the boundaries the waters cannot cross. The psalmist concludes, Lord, you have done so many things. Lord, you have done so many things. And all done according to God's wisdom and goodness. Out of what could have been chaos, all wind and rain and all these elements, ingredients of creation, if they were not put into order, it would have been so chaotic. But what all could have been chaos, wind, fire, sky, earth, God, through time, through time, fashions creation for God's purposes. Creation, that wondrous work of God for a people of God and we. And that's who we are. We are the benefactors. We are those who have received all these gifts of creation. The beauty of the earth the power of water, all that sustains this life, the many things that God has done for us, people in waiting for every day, every day, if not every hour, we wait for something that God has provided for us to sustain us, to give us strength, to enable us to put one foot in front of the other and to make it to the next day. And there's Job. Job who was waiting and waiting and waiting waiting with great desperation. Even though most of his family and friends wanted him just to curse God and give up, Job waited. 
He was in this deep conversation. He was making a case before God, pleading to God to, to, to have God reveal to him why has he been put through all this hardship, all this suffering, all this loss of life. <coughs> Job would argue and demand that God make God's case for, for all this undeserved loss, suffering, and pain that he and his family had experienced. And this morning, what Charles shared with us is the beginning of that conversation between Job and God. God's long-awaited response to Job's plea for understanding. Like us. Sometimes we just plead for understanding. Why is it this way, God? Why, why am I in this situation? Or why is the world this way and, and suffering people throughout these corners? We wait and wait for God's response. And this morning we hear this response. But God offers no reason God really doesn't answer at all what Job was wanting to hear. Job wanted to hear why, and God simply denies Job's accusations of God's indifference to justice. Job is then asked questions. Job is asked questions. Instead of getting answers, he gets questions, and God wants to know where he was, who he is. Job is called by God to prepare for God's questioning. God begins a series of creation-based questions, inquiring where Job was. Where were you, Job, when the earth foundations were laid and measured? God wants to know if Job knows what the footage is in terms of the foundation, how it was sunk, and how it was laid, that cornerstone. And here we listen to God, the Creator, engaging humanity. We understand it when we read it off the page of the scripture that it's, it's a conversation between Job and God, but really it's a, it's a conversation between God and humanity. God the creator engaging humanity in the questions of creation. The questions of in the great mystery of how the earth became what it is. Of course, there's great science and, and, and information that we get. But we get to a certain point and through all that information and science that there's still mystery and still questions of how things came to be. And, and here God and Job are entering into that great mysterious conversation. Job representing humanity is called into the divine conversation of the ingredients and process of creation. The psalmist and the writer of Job invite us to examine this wonderful ministry and mission and mystery of creation. As a people of faith, we look to the goodness of God as the source of all that we enjoy in life. We do not take for granted what we receive, that those gifts that sustain us, food and water and clean air and shelter and family and friends, we do not take for granted as gifts. The earth in all its fullness is a summons to praise and thank God. All that we have is a call gift that calls us to respond, to praise and thank God for what God has done for us. Oftentimes we like to take credit for what we have and pat ourselves on the back. But the psalmist and Job and God's conversation with Job remind us that we have to pause for a second and try to answer these questions. Is everything that you have because of who you are or what you've been doing? Only a partial yes to that answer. God has given us gifts to provide for ourselves and to provide for others, but we want to dig deeper. We want to go deeper into understanding the, the gifts of life and to be able to cherish them in a way beyond the simple acts of consumption. You see, the mystery of creation lies beyond the boundaries of science and consumption. It is a holy place when we start to really think and we, if we meditate or we, we pray about it or we, 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 we see the beauty of creation when we stand up on a hillside or just drive down the street and see the beauty of these colors. Yes, there's an explanation of why the leaves change, but there's something beyond that. That beauty calls us to respond with thanksgiving and praise. That a world could be created and fashioned in such a way that would touch our hearts and bring joy and smiles to our face. It's the holy place where we hear the voice of the psalmist proclaiming the power and might of God. Yes, that all these wonderful things that are put together by God for our purposes. It's a sacred place that we discover the mystery and beauty of our daily experience. If we get busy and we don't pay attention, of course, you will not discover that mystery and that beauty because we just get so wrapped up in all the things and, oh, all of a sudden, 
we discover it because we see that, that red tree or that yellow tree blazing in color that causes us to pause just for a second and proclaim the beauty of creation and give thanks. This is what Job learned about God in his final conversation with God. But God proclaims God's creative power and ends with God's restorative goodness with Job. God reminds Job that he wasn't there at the beginning, that God is the creator. But at the end of the story for Job, all is restored in his family, his wealth, his blessings. God needed to be in conversation with humanity and with, with Job to remind him who God is and what God has done and, and why God is who God is. Both Job and the psalmist discover the power and light and the holy relationship between God and God's creation. We have to keep that in mind. God and God's creation and our relationship to, to God and beauty and the bounty of creation. Today, eager consumption rules over <coughs> prayer, full and thankful cooperation. Today, we get so busy and consuming, we're so busy getting this or looking for that, we, we, we find ourselves eager to have and with the things that we need and the things that we want. Of course, there are differences between needs and wants. And what happens that overshadows what we're called to be as human beings, which is to be those that are prayerful, praiseful, and thankful for God's gifts to us, and that we are to cooperate with God's creation, not just consume it. The bounty of creation is being consumed in ways that reflect. The bounty of creation is being consumed in ways that reflect a disconnect from the mystery of creation. A disconnect. Creation is not Walmart, where you can go and just take things off the shelf, consume them, and then dispose of what remains. Creation is a, is a call from God to, to praise and to thank God for what is given, but also to be part of that process of, of reconciling humanity to creation by cooperating, by, by offering something back, by, by restoring, and by making sure things are protected and things are shared. Humanity as a whole, sometimes we see this so clearly in our own behaviors and in the behaviors of the world, behaves as if creation is not a gift from God. We care for it to be shared. The psalmist proclaims that God covered the earth with water. Over and over you see that whether you go to Genesis or the variety of creation psalms, you'll see the psalmist and the writers proclaiming God covered the earth with water like a piece of clothing, says the psalmist in 104. But today, we, when we look at water, when we think about water, we fail to remember that 70% of the earth is covered with water, and that of that 70%, only 2.5% is fresh water. Did you know that? 70% of the earth covered with water, but only 2.5% of that water is fresh. And by the way, out of that 2.5%, only 1% of the water on the earth is available for drinking and used by humanity. One percent. As the people of God, we're called to praise and thank God and to take notice and to cooperate with creation and to, to be willing to understand that it is not a source that is without limit. Yes, God provides, but God also expects that we involve ourselves in the, in the care of creation and the renewal of the earth. While the psalmist sees the beauty and expansiveness of God's creation, the water that we as humans rely on for daily life is limited. It is not accessible to all God's people. That 1% that's available for drinking is not available to all of God's people. Some of it's too hard to reach. Some of it's, a, it's just, just it's not there because of the nature of the environment, the, the geography. And I believe, brothers and sisters, and maybe you agree with me, that, that the limits on life and the excess, inaccessibility of water are not part of God's plan for creation. When, God, when the psalmist was giving praise and thanks to God, it, it was not the notion that it wouldn't be available for all of God's people, the great gifts of creation. I, this morning, and I tell you, I believe that in praise and thanks of God, a God who is just, 
God who is merciful, a God who, who has created water as a gift for life, as a right for all of God's people. But not all God's people have water. The United Nations estimates by two, uh, 2025, 1.8 billion people will live in areas where there is not enough water. Ten years from now, 1.8 billion people will live with the reality of water scarcity. That's not part of the Creator's plan. That God's people would be without water in the basics of life. 60% of who we are is water. We must have water to sustain us. And when water is scarce, all aspects of life are harmed. And I'm so happy that we're able to send out, I think it's going to be this week, $3,000 to our sister school in Ghana to put a well in there so that the students will have water right there after school. They won't have to, to take time off from classes and school time to, to put the, the containers on their head and go fetch water. They'll just go to the, the faucet and turn it on. So all that time, those 20, 30 minute trips to go and get that water at the well nearby will be used for education. And when you multiply those 20 or 30 minutes times 191 students, it means a lot to be able to have that gift. Water is one of the many things that summons the psalmist to wonder and praise God. God also inquires of Job if he has the power. Job, do you have the power? Humanity, do you have the power to reign over the earth, to provide what is needed, to provide the water that is a visible sign of life? And a vital ingredient of God's creation. Brothers and sisters, the psalmist proclaims to us. Verse 24, Psalm 104. Lord, you have done so many things. Today I can only wonder what God is saying back to us. Is God saying the same thing to us? People of God, you have done so many things. And maybe... There's a tear on the face of God. As God looks upon creation and sees the many things that were counter to God's creative plan, counter to the things that the psalmist was praising God for. Brothers and sisters, friends, the world is changing, and more people depend on what creation can offer. Jesus understood this dependency. Jesus understood the connection between water and life. In the Gospel of John, we hear Jesus using the term living water. Jesus understood the saving power of water. Jesus understood that water could connect other people to the love of God. And that is a symbol to wash away sin as well as to, to quench the thirst of the thirsty and the dying. And provide new life to those that are sick. Jesus reminds us that when we share water with one another, when we share water with one who is thirsty, that we're actually sharing it with him. And so as the psalmist proclaims the good news of water created by God, Jesus proclaims the good news that that is what God has given to us. Make sure that all have water so that they may know God's love through me. Water is God's gift for life. It's meant to be shared. And so, brothers and sisters, out of, the, out of the chaos of the ingredients of creation comes God's gift of love and life. Not just in water, but in all of creation. And while we enjoy these ingredients, we must prayerfully consider our needs of our neighbors as we go forth in life. We must thoughtfully contribute to the cause that brings the ingredients of life to all of God's people in waiting. Whatever it takes to put into the, the worldly crock pot, to the box, we must contribute our part so that we can find a way to make sure all the ingredients of God's beauty and creation are shared by all of God's people. We must remember when we share the ingredients of life with our neighbors that we share them with Jesus at the same time. There are so many things that God has done for us, and there are so many things that we can do for God. Amen.